Good afternoon. My name is Joel Hewitt, subject matter expert here at the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. We are very pleased today to present our webinar on the Silmarils program of the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity using active infrared spectroscopy excuse me, for chemical detection. Our speaker and presenter today is Dr. Christy DeWitt, Program Manager at IARPA. We will introduce her further in just a few minutes. So two notes as we begin. First, the webinar chat function at the top right corner of your screen is enabled, so feel free to type in any questions as you go along. We'll have a question and answer session at the end. A copy of the slide deck will be available for download at the end of the presentation, as well as tomorrow. Also, please note that we are recording the webinar. The video webcast will be available for download tomorrow as well. So first, a bit of background regarding our center. We are a Department of Defense sponsored entity, one of three information analysis centers, or IACs. Organizationally, we fall under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTEC, and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our mission is to be the go-to R&D, S&T, and RDT&E leader within the Homeland Defense and Security community. We achieve this by providing timely and relevant information, superior technical solutions, and high-quality products to the DOD and HDS, COIs, and COPs. In doing so, we are able to help solve the most challenging technical problems facing the government. We pursue this mission across eight focus areas, alternative energy, biometrics, CBRN defense, critical infrastructure protection, cultural <laughs> studies, homeland defense and security, medical, and weapons of mass destruction. Our external subject matter expert network is a critical tool in achieving this mission. And if you have expertise in one of our focus areas, we encourage you to apply. Our SMEs help us provide the military and government with the most up-to-date and cutting-edge information and innovations. Dr. DeWitt is an excellent example of a SME who we often collaborate with and turn to for technical advice. So now to introduce our speaker. Dr. DeWitt is a program manager for the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity. At IARPA, she runs a portfolio of chemical detection programs, including Silmarils and Magellan. She has previously served in different roles at both IARPA and DARPA, and has done performer work at several companies, developing fiber lasers, wind sensing systems, and skin detection sensors. Dr. DeWitt has a BS in chemistry and physics from the University of Mary Washington, and a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Virginia. She did her postdoctoral work at the National Institute of Standards and Technology as a National Research Council researcher. And Christy, welcome. Thank you. All right, so um, IARPA, the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, is the advanced research component of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. In its approximately 10-year history, IARPA has transitioned research to all 16 coins of the intelligence community. Uh, can you forward the slide? Thanks. IARPA's mission is to envision and lead high-risk, high-payoff research that delivers innovative technology for future overwhelming intelligence advantage. We tackle complex and multidisciplinary problems and emphasize technical excellence and technical truth. Like our ARPA cousins, DARPA, ARPA-E, HSARPA and BARDA, we do not run and staff our own labs. We fund academia and industry through full and open competition to the greatest possible extent, considering security issues, as force multipliers to bring the best minds to bear on our problems. Program managers at IARPA are rotational. We're hired to tackle the current hardest problems that IC will face in the next five to 10 years with research programs that run from three to five years. New hires allow the organization to continuously adapt to developing challenges and the changing needs of the intelligence community. IARPA programs have goals and metrics that are clear, measurable, ambitious, and credible, and we use rigorous, independent test and evaluation to ensure we know how our performers measure against the metrics. IARPA programs involve intelligence community partners from start to finish, from development of program metrics through transition. We encourage peer-reviewed publication of results and data to the greatest possible extent, 
both from our performers and from our test and evaluation teams. IARPA's chemical detection portfolio represents a technology toolkit tailored to the intelligence community's needs. This includes programs to tackle mission space challenges of denied territory, homeland security, and forensic analysis. Compounds of interest include pretty much all molecules that have an intelligence interest, including chemical weapons and poisons, explosives, including primary, secondary, oxidizer fuel, and homemade explosives, narcotics, including illegal, misused prescription and designer drugs, nuclear fuel cycle material, and bioweapon signatures. Collection and analysis modalities that IARPA is interested in include trace surface residues, in situ gas phase collection and analysis, and field collection for lab analysis. This webinar is on the CIMARILS program and the associated Morgoth's Crown Challenge, which is developing active infrared spectroscopy based approaches focusing on trace detection, trace surface detection. IARPA program managers name their own programs and are encouraged to come up with creative names that will pique interest. There is also an informal nerd off for the most complex appropriate acronym. In J.R.R. Tolkien's mythology, the Cimmerils are the three jewels crafted by Fionor, who, which hold the unmarred light of the two trees. It is light from the Cimmeril that Galadriel gives Frodo in the first Lord of the Rings movie in a glass vial to have as a light in dark places when all other lights have gone out. Morgoth was the evil master lord who stole the Cimmerils from the elves and wore them mounted in an iron crown. Many wars were fought and lives lost over possession of the Cimmerils. Current techniques for detecting chemicals in the field range from collecting samples and transporting them back to a laboratory for analysis, to small point sensors that alert to the presence of a single chemical or chemical class, to passive or active optical sensors that can search the ground for chemical targets from an airborne platform. Each different chemical detection method has both strengths and limitations. Laboratory analysis techniques, such as nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, mass spectrometry, Fourier transfer from infrared spectroscopy, and various forms of chromatography provide precise chemical identification from very small quantities of sample material. But there is a time lag of hours to days for a sample to be collected and transported to the laboratory, and collecting enough samples to comprehensively analyze large areas for trace surface residues is cost and time prohibitive. Field portable versions of several of these techniques do exist, which reduce analysis time to minutes. But to test for surface residues, samples still must be collected by wiping or swabbing the surfaces of interest. Also, the sensitivity and specificity of field portable instruments is significantly lower than the performance capability of their laboratory counterparts. Selective binding assays can be very sensitive for a particular target chemical or chemical class, but large arrays are required for broad chemical identification. Also, only gas phase molecules or surface residues with high vapor pressures can be detected because in order to trigger a detection, the molecule of interest must drift to and physically contact the selective binding array. Optical spectroscopy-based standoff techniques are the most viable approach for rapid, high area coverage, chemical detection of trace residues on surfaces. Passive hyperspectral imaging using ambient light or thermal emissions as a source has demonstrated the ability to detect and identify a variety of compounds. But there are significant sensitivity limitations. Roughly speaking, at least 3 to 10% of the target area must be covered by target chemical, corresponding to milligram per square centimeter to gram per square centimeter coverage rates. Additionally, while there are a number of existing active standoff obstacle spectroscopy techniques, such as fluorescent spectroscopy, differential, light, differential absorption light detection and ranging, or DIAL, Raman spectroscopy, and laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, or LIBS, that offer either high sensitivity or high specificity, none can simultaneously provide the needed performance metrics in both categories. Many optical standoff techniques also have additional drawbacks, such as eye safety concerns, which limit CONOPS. Overall, there is a capability gap for high throughput ID of trace surface chemicals in clutter. This graphic provides a brief flowchart overview of the technology space chosen for the CIMARILS program. The first decision point was to choose an optical spectroscopy approach to enable standoff trace surface detection of materials with low to no vapor pressure. That is, we assume that no molecules of interest will come to our detector, so we need a mechanism of probing them where they are. From the range of potential optical spectroscopy techniques, we chose active vibrational spectroscopy to provide definitive molecular ID. 
Electronic absorption spectroscopy was down-selected based on its broad features, electronic emission spectroscopy based on its need for an intense, non-ice-safe pump source, passive vibrational spectroscopy based on insufficient sensitivity and clutter performance, and active rotational spectroscopy based on the fact that it only provides definitive signal for small gas phase molecules. This left infrared absorption spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy as potential candidates. Although infrared spectroscopy is more technically challenging in terms of sources and detectors, the average 10 to the 6 higher per photon signal level promised the best trade-off on our investment in terms of sensitivity with an eye-safe system. The CIMRLs, or Standoff Illuminator for Measuring Absorbance and Reflectance Infrared Light Signatures program, aims to develop a portable system for real-time standoff detection and identification of trace chemical residues on surfaces using active infrared spectroscopy at a 30 meter range. Program goals include high chemical sensitivity and specificity across a broad range of target classes, effective operation in a real world environment accounting for issues such as gas phase and surface absorbed clutter, varying substrates, temperature, humidity, indoor outdoor background light, a system that is eye safe and has a virtually unobservable, and unobservable illumination beam, human portable size, and a power draw commensurate with limited duration battery operation, as well as a rapid scan rate. This figure provides some representative examples of potential CIMRLs applications. These notional operational concepts are designed to motivate an understanding of program goals and metrics, and as such should not be taken as either a comprehensive list of potential applications or a guarantee that any of these specific applications will be implemented. Possible applications envisioned include scanning people, vehicles or cargo moving through a portal or past a monitor station at normal speed, scanning a room or vehicle for target chemicals in law enforcement or safety clearing applications, looking for explosive fingerprints on car doors or vehicles, entering a parking garage or approaching a checkpoint, analyzing pavement in the area of a suspected chemical release, or monitoring factory emissions for transients. Although the hardest problem that Simmerals is tacking tackling is trace chemicals on surfaces, the program has metrics for and is testing against both gas phase and solution phase scenarios as well. <clears throat> Overall, the infrared spectrum of a molecule provides a chemical fingerprint that can be used to identify a particular compound. The long wave infrared or LWARE region of the infrared spectrum, which ranges from 7 to 13 microns, is called the fingerprint region. Vibrational resonances here correspond to overall stretching or breathing modes of an entire molecule and are therefore very specific to a particular molecule. The midwave infrared region of the infrared spectrum, which ranges from 3 to 5 micron, is sometimes referred to as the functional group region. The higher energy vibrational resonances here are indicative of certain chemical bond types being present in the molecule, such as an OH stretch or a carbonyl group. Additional information can be found in the shortwave infrared region. 1 to 3 micron, which corresponds to overtone and combination vibrational modes. <clears throat> there are good reasons you cannot buy an infrared based system today for standoff trace detection on surfaces. These issues can be roughly partitioned into the categories of spectrometry and spectroscopy. The category of spectrometry covers the hardware and processing necessary to collect an infrared spectrum of the target on a surface with sufficient signal to noise for detection. Active infrared spectrometry first requires a light source that spans the wavelength range of region of interest either continuously or discreetly with sufficient resolution. Broadband illuminators, glow bars, or black bodies cover this range well and are the light sources used in benchtop Fourier transform infrared or FTIR instruments, which are laboratory workhorses for chemical analysis, including explosives. But the light from broadband illuminators cannot be propagated well without very large, clumsy optics and these are therefore not useful for compact standoff detectors. And historically, while lasers have been available at a few specific wavelengths in the infrared, for example, the 10.6 micron carbon dioxide laser, lasers that either span or tune through the infrared have not been. That dynamic is changing, though. A number of companies, using a variety of different technical approaches, have developed and are continuously improving quantum cascade laser products that can tune through the long wave infrared with a discrete number of modules. Interband cascade lasers are being explored for similar tuning through the mid wave infrared. 
Other researchers are developing fiber-based multi-stage lasers that use chalcogenide-based fibers to produce broadband midwave infrared, long wave infrared laser light through supercontinuum generation. Also important to active infrared spectroscopy are infrared detectors. Shortwave infrared, midwave infrared, long wave infrared detectors have been available for many years, but recent advances in new materials and fabrication techniques are improving sensitivity, reducing dark count, increasing acquisition speed, reducing or eliminating cooling requirements, and perhaps most importantly, reducing cost, making standoff active infrared detection within striking distance of a reasonable cost point for broad adoption. The cat second category of spectroscopy covers the algorithms and processing necessary to determine whether the infrared signal obtained by the spectrometer contains a signature distinctly identifiable as a target or target-related compound. Target signatures must be distinguishable from spectral features belonging to other compounds in the same sample area. The signal-to-clutter ratio is often more important to detection than signal-to-noise. And since trace features often do not look like bulk features, you either have to measure every possible combination and have a huge searchable library, predictably model, or focus on conserved features. Most materials, uh, most materials in nature Sorry. Most materials in nature have unique infrared signatures, the exception being pure atomic materials and nonpolar diatomic gases, which do not have infrared active modes. Infrared signatures obtained from a spectrometer will likely not be isolated signatures corresponding to a single chemical species, but a composite spectrum that includes both the signatures distinct to the targets of interest and also the signature contributions from the substrate other contaminants on the surface, and volatile organic compounds in the air between the sensor and the surface under investigation. Often the signature of the target material will be small compared to the substrate and background signatures. As an example, in the figure here, colored lines show individual transmission spectra of nine gas phase chemical species at equal concentration. And the black lines show the spectrum of the mixture of all nine. To add to the overall complexity, the infrared signature of a given explosive on a surface can be very different depending on the surface material and the deposition history of the target material. Bulk solid or liquid samples or non-interacting gas phase samples under standard conditions have relatively invariant spectra. However, for trace solids on surfaces or for optically thin, transparent or translucent liquid films, which are the molecular forms of greatest interest for standoff chemical detection, the infrared absorption spectra do vary significantly, depending on a number of, intrin of intrinsic and extrinsic effects. Intrinsic factors are those that influence how light fundamentally interacts with a given substance. Intrinsic, extrinsic, intrinsic effects include material properties that are dependent on the molecule's thermodynamic state and its molecular level interactions. For example, those due to absorption on a substrate, varying degrees of hydration, and interactions within solutions. Extrinsic factors relate the light interaction to the geometry of both the target sample and its surroundings. Important extrinsic factors include particle size effects, optically thin material mixtures, sample morphology dependence, that is the chemical presentation, and illumination in viewing geometries. These factors can cause the shape and intensity ratio of the reflectance bands to change, or in extreme cases, the same feature to appear as either an absorptive loss of intensity or dispersive, both a loss and increase in intensity feature, depending on substrate type or deposition methodology. Representative examples of the influence of particle size, substrate target interactions, and target dependent deposition history on infrared reflectance are shown in these figures. Um, panel A shows a comparison of sodium uh, and sodium nitrate reflectance spectra of different particle sizes, showing how some bands shift in intensity with changing particle size, while others do not. Panel B shows a comparison of reflectance spectra of silicon oil on high-density polyethylene, or HDPE, versus roughened aluminum, showing how the spectral features can be either upward or downward going, depending on whether the substrate is metallic or dielectric. Panel C shows a comparison of caffeine deposited on glass as particles via sieving 
versus caffeine deposited on glass is a crystallized thin film via airbrushing from solution, showing absorptive versus dispersive features simply based on particle morphology. <clears throat> the Simmerals program is a four and a half year effort structured as three 18 month phases that kicked off in the spring of 2016. Phase one involved separate development of algorithms and spectrometer hardware. Algorithms were tested against government provided data set. Spectrometer development involved construction of a laboratory breadboard traceable to the phase three design. Performance was demonstrated against standard samples representative of real world backgrounds and clutter. In phase two, components needed to be approaching final size, weight, and power, but the system is still a laboratory breadboard. The spectrometer and algorithms must be integrated. New advances are being incorporated to improve sensitivity and specificity. Metrics specified each performer's key advantages were added, and participation in outdoor field tests organized by mission partners was added as a requirement. In phase three, the end of program demonstration will be a prototype system with real-time processing. Participation in field test exercises held by mission partners is required. Five performers were funded in phase one and three carried forward into phase two. A brief synopsis of each of the phase one performers technology is given here. The uh, block MEMS group has a system approach involving adaptive step scanning. Um, their system's key features is that it can provide very long range with increased power. Their algorithm is a combination of ACE, sparse ACE, and Bayesian approaches. And their um, strengths and weaknesses of their algorithm is that it has complementary approaches. The Bayes scales to large libraries, but it has more computational complexity. The Lidos group, um, their system of overall system approach is a scanned FTIR. The key feature of their system is that it can do rapid forensic imaging. Their uh, algorithm approach uses a combination of ADA boost with an array of classifiers for solids and liquids and ACE for gases. And the strengths and weaknesses of their algorithm is that training can find classification clues not seen by humans, but they're challenged by large libraries and clutter. LGS Innovations had a system approach of dual comb spectroscopy. Their key feature of their system was high resolution gas spectroscopy. Their algorithm approach was decision tree based machine learning, um, but that's also very computationally intensive. <clears throat> Physical sciences approach was a spatial heterodyne and a barometer. The key system feature was that they could deal well with moving targets. Their algorithm approach was straight ACE, um, the advantages being that that's a mature algorithm, but it does not scale well with library size or with um, cases where you don't have a small amount of target chemical and a large amount of background. Spectrum Photonics has a system approach of a thin disk interferometer. The key features of their system is very low cost, and low power for shorter range. Their algorithm approach was a combination of single pixel approach similar to ACE with eigenvalues and match filters. One of the strengths of their uh, algorithm was using spatial information, um, but the problem is it cannot handle large libraries with limited spectral bands. Going into phase three, we've down selected to three performers, providing a bit more detail on those. The overall uh, block MEMS approach uh, involves rapidly tunable, a rapidly tunable quantum cascade laser source and uses adaptive um, algorithms that can change the, the uh, spacing of the wavelengths it looks at depending on uh, initial, an initial scan. Lidos uses a super continuum laser source and a rotating disk uh, FTIR spectrometer. Their broadband laser source minimizes speckle effects. Uh, Spectrum Photonics uses a thin disk interferometer directly mounted to an SLS focal plane array. And their um, key features is that they're very low cost and low power for shorter range. Looking at the full teams that we have in phase two, um, we have uh, Block MEMS and their subcontractors listed, Lidos and their subcontractors, Spectrum Photonics and their subcontractors. Our uh, test and evaluation team includes uh, John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, the Naval Research Lab, Pacific Northwest National Lab, Incendia National Lab. We also have subject matters, uh, expertise support, and contracting provided by the Air Force Research Laboratory. As previously mentioned, IARPA places a lot of emphasis on rigorous tests and evaluation, 
For Simmerals, in addition to subject matter expertise and evaluation at all program meetings, this includes measuring reflectance spectra and transmission spectra in potassium bromide pellets to estimate N and K values for all solid chemicals, directly measuring complex index of refraction, reflection for liquids, and transmission spectra for gases, producing calibrated sample coupons to test performance against program metrics using airbrushing, sieving, quantitative dry transfer, fur, and finger press techniques, periodic blind testing of performer systems for performance evaluation, and developing a synthetic spectrum model to aid in performer algorithm training, providing an economical means of testing against thousands of sample coupons to determine probability of detection and probability of false alarm. TNE team members have published papers and given conference presentations on techniques developed to enable Simmerill's test and evaluation. And the entire Simmerill spectral database is in the process of being made available as a NIST web book. A few snapshots of the Simmerill's TNE team activities include um, starting on the uh, left. The NRL Figure Press, which allows transfer of materials from a calibrated donor coupon to a surface using programmable force. A comparison of the morphology of sieved versus airbrushed caffeine on glass. Airbrushed samples at a month six test site uh, for blind testing. The synthetic uh, data viewer. And PNNL's creation of very short path length liquid cells to enable the full dynamic range of liquid measurements by squeezing commercial liquid cells in a press. A few snapshots of uh, the Block MEM system. Block's approach combines fast wavelength tuning quantum cascade laser and interband cascade laser with fast cameras so that surfaces can be scanned at extremely high speed. Acquisition of a hypercube with 120 discrete wavelength steps in 10 microseconds has been demonstrated. The prototype system under development will be able to generate chemical detection maps of a surface at 5 meter standoff with high spatial resolution, 0.5 millimeter, and at video frame weights, 30 hertz. The system will also be able to measure chemicals at standoff distances up to 50 meters. Innovations include new laser designs that have increased laser power by a factor of about 10, novel methods to mitigate the effects of speckle noise, and development of detection algorithms and hardware that can respond adaptively to the environment and target. Uh, LIDOS' approach uses an infrared supercontinuum laser source in combination with a high-speed rotating prism Fourier transform infrared spectrometer to detect trace chemicals at standoff ranges up to 30 meters. Innovations include a novel cascade of three nonlinear optical fibers to generate high-power wide bandwidth supercontinuum, direct capture of short source pulses to maximize signal intensity and, complete, and suppress the thermal background, and use of machine learning to capture the spectral signature variability that results from sparse contaminant particles on surfaces. The Spectrum Photonics team is focused on the development and demonstration of advanced multiband hyperspectral imaging methods for trace detection and identification applications in an extremely compact sensor configuration. The approach is particularly suited to trace chemical identification or challenging scene conditions, such as complex chem complex chemical mixtures or significant background clutter. The system uses a new type of spatial Fourier transform spectrometer based on Spectrum's ultra-compact hyperspectral imaging system, or UCHIS interferometer. The UCHIS element replaces the bulky interferometer typically associated with Fourier transform spectrometer spectroscopy sensors with a novel thin disk configuration. The thin disk interferometer is so small it can be incorporated inside the camera package, effectively enabling conversion of an infrared camera into an Imaging Infrared Fourier Transform System. The rest of the results shown in this brief are taken by the Block MEMS breadboard system, which is currently more developed and capable of rapid data collection than the other Phase II systems. These figures show detection results from Phase I on a number of outdoor surfaces at 5 meter standoff. The image on the left shows visible images and detection map results for detection of between 50 and 100 micrograms of caffeine on shingles, sand, asphalt, and concrete. The image on the right shows a visible image detection map and spectra for discrimination of caffeine, warfarin, and beta carotene on concrete. System testing in November 2018 with increased illumination power and improved algorithms 
will test detection out to 25 meters at much lower non-visible concentration levels. <clears throat> Also from phase one, the figure on the left shows detection of a much smaller quantity of caffeine, 10 micrograms, on stone shingles at one meter standoff. The figure on the right shows the infrared spectra obtained for positive identification of RDX on glass at concentrations ranging from 70 micrograms per square centimeter to 0.8 micrograms per square centimeter. These Figure shows key results from a set of experiments done to measure the detection of RDX and PETN on eight different material samples associated with portable electronic devices. For RDX and PETN, an estimated limited detection of three nanograms and six nanograms were obtained respectively. One of the most interesting results from this experiment series was that contamination was still found to be detectable after the surface had been cleaned of any visible explosive traces through wiping with a dry cloth, wiping with a water dampened cloth, and wiping with isopropyl alcohol. <clears throat> Another set of experiments done by the Simarils program involved a variety of real-world substrates of interest for screening packages, luggage, cargo, clothing, vehicles, building materials, etc. All the substrates tested were wild real-world materials with no cleaning prior to uh, target deposition. For example, tires from a scrapyard, fabrics that had been washed and worn, a cardboard box delivered by Amazon, soda cans and water bottles from a community recycling bin. <clears throat> These figures show some representative detection results for aspirin and RDX as targets on the various substrates, including a Coke can, painted drywall, hardwood, marble, a zipper, and pig skin. A close stand-in to human skin in terms of water, fat, and hemoglobin content. The sample images show uh, the sample images show that um, the deposited residue, or lack thereof in several cases, under a microscope. The detection maps show the ID of target versus background. The chemical detection libraries used for these experiments contain signatures for the targets only, not for the background materials. That is, the background signature was built up in real time by its learning algorithms and differential processing. Measured spectra compared the spectrum from the target pixels versus the average spectra of the background pixels. <clears throat> this figure shows spectra of 10 micrograms of saccharin on various substrates, including leather, cotton cloth, wood, a tire, and a glass tile. Note that despite the difference underlying background spectra, saccharin features are clearly discriminable in each spectrum and compared to the reflecting spectra of bulk saccharin, shown below in blue. Also note that the featured positions of the literature saccharin absorption coefficient in light red in the bottom graph do not line up well with the bulk and trace feature positions. This is an issue that we have found to be prevalent over the course of the Simarils program, and we are investing in methodology development and measure, a measurement campaign to measure more accurate absorption coefficients of solids, since this data is very important to improve trace chemical detection algorithms. These images show the reflectance spectra of a number of prescription and over-the-counter drugs. These are all commercial tablets which were ground up using a mortar and pestle, so contain both active ingredients and fillers and binders. If you've ever carefully compared the listed, ingre listed quantity of active ingredient versus the size and weight of the average pill, you know that the majority of the volume for most drugs is filler and binder, not active ingredient. So a first assumption would be that the majority of the spectral features observed would be from the filler and binder, not the active ingredients. However, as these recorded spectra show, the different drugs have very different, distinct reflectance spectra, which is not what would be expected if the majority of the signal was from fillers and binders, which would be much more similar between the different drug types. Also, the two spectra on the top left, labeled hydrocodone, acetaminophen, and codeine, represent, respectively, generic and name brand versions of Tylenol with codeine, or Tylenol-3. The shorthand labeling was done by the BlockMEMS PI, who did not realize that Tylenol with codeine and hydrocodone acetaminophen are the same thing. The extreme similarity of the spectra stems from the use of the same active ingredients. Minor differences are from the differences in filler and binder composition between the generic and name brand mixtures. This data strongly suggests that the filler and binder spectra are broad and featureless, not surprising for carbohydrates and polymers, while the strong distinct features correspond to signatures from the active ingredients. 
This data indicates a possible use case for active infrared spectroscopy, performing non-contact inspection of pharmaceuticals for quality control and purity confirmation. <clears throat> These next results demonstrate the ability to detect trace levels of compounds down to a limit of detection of approximately two nanograms through a variety of plastic bags, including clear Ziploc bags, black plastic trash bags, and thick clear plastic bags. The final topic of this webinar, this webinar will address is the Morgos Crown Prize Challenge that IARPA ran in conjunction with the Severals program IARPA's Morgoth's Crown Prize Challenge, which stands for Modeling of Reflectance Given Only Transmission or High Concentration Spectra for Chemical Recognition Over Widely vary, envi Varying Environments, a properly nerdy algorithm, was a crowdsourced effort to encourage new approaches in infrared spectral modeling to quantitatively predict trace spectra on surfaces from bulk reflectance spectra. The degree to which infrared spectral signatures vary depends on the nature of the sample under consideration. For example, bulk solid or liquid samples or non-interacting gas phase samples under standard conditions have relatively invariant spectra. However, for trace solids on surfaces or for optically thin, transparent or translucent liquid films, which are the molecular forms of greatest interest for standoff chemical detection, the infrared absorbance spectra do vary significantly, depending on a number of intrinsic and extrinsic effects as previously discussed. Currently, most fielded libraries are built from measurements and calibration targets. Physics-based models work well for fitting spectra, but are much less accurate for predicting spectra and are too computationally intensive for widespread adoption. Where we want to go is accurate prediction of spectra at any loading, particle size, or morphology based on measured substrate and bulk spectra. A tie-in to physics is desirable, but not the end-all. The first priority is an algorithm that works and is computationally efficient. The question asked by the Morgoth Crown Challenge is what the physical chemistry community can learn from the machine learning, statistics, and computer science community. The challenge was hosted on the Top Coder platform with financial prizes for the best solutions. Challenge participants were given reflectance spectra of both clean surfaces and chemicals of interest in their bulk forms. Five different substrates were used in the challenge that are representative of real world surfaces roughened aluminum, polished aluminum, anodized aluminum, glass. A PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, a common structural plastic sold under brand names such as plexiglass, lexite, and perspex. Four different chemical targets were used, which also represent varying chemical classes and uses. Warfarin, a blood thinner and rat poison, caffeine, acetaminophen or Tylenol, potassium nitrate, an explosive. As a training set, solvers were given 36 spectra representing different loading and deposition conditions of both warfarin and potassium nitrate on the five substrates. Deposition methods included both sieving and airbrushing, which affects the particle size and crystal structure, and particle loadings range, ranged from 10 to 250 micrograms per square centimeter. Participants were then asked to develop an algorithm to predict what the spectra of different combinations of chemicals and substrates would look like. All algorithm development methods and algorithm types were allowed, ranging from first principle physics-based models to pure machine learning approaches. After developing and training their algorithm using the training data set, which was provided with full characterization and metadata. Performers were asked to submit spectral predictions for 18 different substrates and chemical morphology combinations of caffeine. An automated scoring function based on a nonlinear combination of spectral information divergence and spectral angle mapper metrics was used to provide an overall closeness of fit score between the predicted spectra and the measured ground truth data, with higher scores indicating better fits. Challenge participants were provided with their composite score and allowed to submit multiple predictions of the test data set over the course of the challenge in order to iteratively improve their algorithms. At the conclusion of the challenge, the 10 highest scoring participants submitted their algorithm code to the Morgoth's Crown Challenge team. The algorithms were run to provide predictions of an additional 18 different substrate and chemical morphology combinations of acetaminophen, the validation data set, which the participants had never seen or been able to score their algorithm against during development. Scores against this validation set were used to determine the final challenge rankings and prizes. The figure you see out here on the screen shows the distribu distribution of challenge participants and winners by country.
and this figure provides additional data on the top 10 challenge participants. Column 1 provides the participants' online handle. Column 2 provides their country. Columns 3 and 4 are their provisional, test data, and final validation data scores. Scores against the validation data were used for prize awards. Column 5 is the participants' top coder ranking, which is a combined measure of their experience and success in prior top coder challenges. Challengers with high top coder rankings are regular participants in data analysis and machine learning challenges, or challenge participants with low top coder rankings or newer top coder participants, and they have only joined to participate in the Morgoth's Crown Challenge. Column 6 provides a brief summary of the solution approach taken. There are several interesting points to note from these two figures. One, although, though both physics-based, semi-empirical, and machine learning approaches were allowed in the challenge, all the top 10 scores came from machine learning or spectral average-based approaches. None of the rigorous model-based approaches scored in the top 10. And two, although there were a number of US and Western European participants in the challenge, only one scored in the top 10. In broad strokes, the higher scoring participants were those with computer programming and machine learning backgrounds and significant previous experience in data analysis challenges. This is coarsely reflected in the higher scoring participants having generally higher top coder rankings, which indicates solvers with general computer science machine learning backgrounds who regularly participate in data analysis challenges versus experts in spectral modeling who joined top coder just to participate in the Morgoth's Crown Challenge. <coughs> in short, the results of the Morgoth's Crown Challenge showed that machine learning based approaches were better able to quantitatively predict new spectra than physics based models. So does this mean we should simply throw out physics for tackling this problem? Despite the fact that one might argue I am biased as a physical chemist, I would argue that the answer is an emphatic no. The first important point is to recognize what the limitations of the physics based models are and not rely on them in domains they were never intended to work in. Back in the days when all computations were done by hand, or maybe with the help of a slide rule, scientists spent a lot more time thinking about what type of model and calculation was appropriate to apply to a particular problem before tackling it, and were also more aware of the underlying assumptions we were making by our choice of model and how that may affect the overall accuracy of the solution. In general physics, there are exact solutions with the proper caveats observed. For example, Maxwell's equations of electrodynamics are exact as long as you're working with macroscopic charges where discrete quantum effects are not observable in the aggregate and are working with small enough fields that tunneling is not a measurable phenomenon. At the molecular level, the Schrodinger equation is exact, as long as you're not dealing with near relativistic speeds, etc. But there are a limited number of problems that can be directly solved straight up in a closed form fashion using exact equations, charge on a sphere, the hydrogen atom without a second electron, etc. To start to look at any sort of real world problem, you must either make approximations and assumptions that allow the equations to be simplified, but are only valid in the domain where the simplifying assumptions hold, or must result in numerical methods to approximate the solution of the full equation. In the days where you worked out all the math of the simplifying approximations symbolically and then plugged in numbers, or worked out numerical methods by hand, it was very obvious what approximations were made, and therefore how reliable the resulting calculations were expected to be. But today, with powerful computers to run our numerical methods for us, and packaged software or freeware that runs most of the known models in almost any domain, it is common to have expert users modeling things without truly understanding the limitations inherent in the underlying model approximations themselves. Powerful computers now make it possible to brute force computations that were unthinkable just a few years ago. But just because you can compute something using a given model doesn't mean you should. When computations were costly, scientists spent much time making sure the model matched the problem before starting the computation. Today, we just throw our favorite model at the problem. And a lot of the models in use were developed when com computational resources were precious, so have assumptions in them that make them limiting in order to save resources. And then we just throw on perturbative terms to try to adjust them. And many models were developed to give accurate trends, which they do well, but were never meant for scale or accuracy, which we now ask of them. In layman's terms, it is the difference in assuming a cow is a sphere in order to be able to perform a closed form mechanics calculation for a physics test versus pulling out an empirical engineering table when you need to know the actual load bearing capacity of a concrete bridge with a 50% safety factor. It's my belief that the results of the Morgoth's Crown Challenge do not simply denote the winner in an expert versus machine learning competition, but rather recognize what machine learning is really doing and rec reconcile that with more exact theory. The reason that theoretical models do not work perfectly is that most are based on simple models with perturbations added to take increasing complexity into account. 
and if you miss a perturbation, the approach loses accuracy. Given enough data to train on, the machine learning approach simply fits enough variables to get the curve right. And the reason that it has at least some predictive power, instead of just being an after-the-fact fit, is that the universe is governed by physical laws. So if you fit a multi-term approximation to a problem, even if you have not identified what all the terms are, the equation you fit works in the same way as the more first principles approximations. But what you have lost in this approach is the identity of the terms, which limits how adaptable the equation is to parameter changes, and also knowledge of which terms should be fixed under certain condition changes. Personally, I think the best approach to the spectral prediction problem tackled by the Morgoth's Crown Challenge will be a hybrid of the extreme approaches. Using machine learning as a blind approach to find parameters that we may not have considered, i.e. using the data to tell us what is in the data, but informing the machine learning approach with constraints and priors anchored in real scientific understanding. I think this approach will give solutions that are more adaptable to different conditions and require significantly less data on which to train. The need for large training sets of ground truth data is the Achilles heel of all machine learning approaches. But this approach will require treating machine learning not as a black box that magically turns out solutions, but just as a much more efficient and less biased way of arriving at approximate perturbative numerical solutions, which is what scientists have been doing all along. Finally, as Simmerals is an active program currently in phase two of three, its story is not complete yet. Upcoming highlights include, in October 2018, testing in the Joint Ambient Breeze Tunnel at Dugway Proving Grounds against chemical and biological simulants as part of the IE, IEW DDSI Integrated Early Warning for Defending Bases, Stations, and Installations test event, will be testing both aerosol detection and surface detection using witness cards. In November 2018, uh, phase two second benchmark testing at J John Hopkins APL, indoor testing against a variety of blind samples at distances ranging from five to 25 meters. We actually extended the range after these slides were pre-pub approved. And then in March 2019, the phase two third benchmark test also at Johns Hopkins APL, outdoor testing against a variety of blind samples at distances ranging from five to 25 meters. And then in May of 2019, we're going to be doing field testing, screening backpacks and vehicles for explosives and other hazards at the Indianapolis 500. So um, that concludes uh, what I have to say about the slides and open for any questions. Yeah, we've got a handful of great questions from Henry Marcinowski at DITRA. Uh, his first question, you mentioned particle size. How small can you measure or see? Uh, so that somewhat de depends on who is doing our particle size characterization. Um, both Johns Hopkins APL and NRL have different methodologies that they use for that. I believe that NRL can see down to um, about one micron, but that, that's not a number I have really stuck in my head. If you send me your contact information, I'd be uh, uh, happy to follow up with you on that. I just don't have those details with me right now. We've got a couple of other questions coming in. Um, the second question, have you tried looking at chemical warfare agent simulants like TEP or DIMP? And so the answer is not to date as of today. Um, actually, the reason that we're doing this webinar on the 10th as opposed to uh, the 15th when HDIAC uh, had wanted to do that is that we're taking the systems to Dugway Proving Grounds next week and we're doing um, uh, aerosol and surface deposition testing at the JABT against uh, MES, TEP, and DIMP. And then the third question in that series, have you used this technology to look at vapor or aerosols in plumes? Um, and, and so in phase one, we did some testing in static gas cells, um, and the, the testing at the JBT that we're doing next week is the first time we're going to be looking at dynamic plumes. And then Carol We've been asks, focusing in the beginning uh, on measuring samples in plastic bags. Test. What was the result with black plastic? So um, I can't actually back the slides up so that you can see the, the curves, but I, I'm pretty... I'm clipping in my, my paper charts to see if I can describe it. Um, of course, I dropped them on the floor. But um, 
Uh, while you look for that, I'll just go ahead and answer Vincent's question. He'll be able to uh, download a copy at the end of this presentation, and then we will have them posted on our website, hdiac.org, tomorrow. So, and actually, I realized that the, the um, slide that's pasted in there doesn't actually have the, the hefty uh, trash, trash bag shown there. Um, there was a number of different uh, figures, and that was the one that included that. It was it was very similar to the um, kind of in between the mini bag and the uh, uh, Ziploc bag because the plastic thickness was similar. The the dye actually really didn't affect the overall signal level, so it more had to do with the thickness of plastic it was going through. So if maybe we'll have some other questions coming in, um, I'll just ask, what do you see to be the most near term, uh, most impactful application in the next maybe two to three years? So, so I think the point that we're at in terms of, uh, you know, the basic science, um, there's still a lot of work to be done in packaging is sort of the shorter range scanning. So looking, you know, a meter or less standoff, things like uh, scanning clothing or scanning, you know, mail, scanning packages, uh, things like that, sort of a conveyor belt type application. Um, the longer, you know, 30 meter standoff, um, still working on developing some of the laser sources to be able to get enough laser power. Um, the Simrails program has a requirement of class one eye safety, but we're still more than a factor of 10 below that in terms of headroom. So it's just difficult to get enough laser power and the tunable lasers out that far. So Pat McCloskey asks, will the Simrails technology be incorporated with DARPA's Sigma Plus? Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I can't answer that question right now because Sigma Plus is still in source selection. Um, I know some information, but I can't say it here, but I would say, you know, stick around. It, it, it's definitely in the mix. All right, looks like we've got a, a few more questions coming in. Christine Tomlinson asks, do you think a red polypropylene bag would have a similar profile as the black bags? I, I would suspect so. Um, what, one of the things I would say that, that would lead me to believe that, I, I believe some of the, um, one of the examples showed detection on a Diet Coke can. And we actually had the, the Coke can had, if you look in the microscope image, both black and red uh, printing that you can see in the visible. But when you look at the infrared detection map, you actually don't see any of those dyes. So in the, the mid-wave and long-wave wavelengths that we're looking at, those visible dyes just really don't show up. Of the differences. Uh, Carol Brevet asks, are you actively working with anyone on mail and package applications? Uh, we're working with Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Gregory Nichols asks, you mentioned a later phase will be field tested at the Indy 500. Do you anticipate any challenges due to environmental factors like heat and humidity? I expect there will be challenges. That's a lot of why we want to start doing outdoor tests kind of in the, the more tame parking lot environment first and then um, uh, looking there because I, I suspect that, you know, the desert testing will be unfriendly in a lot of ways in terms of dust, but more friendly in terms of heat and humidity. So you really want to test this thing in like the middle of Alabama in the summer because that's going to be the hardest uh, situation for an infrared based system to work under, which water is your biggest interference. Gotcha. Well, for a final question, I'll just stick with the uh, science fiction theme. And what year do you think we'll finally get around to a uh, portable tricorder type chemical identification device? Um, I mean, I want to think that that you know that the the trajectory difference I see in terms of what's technically possible now versus ten years ago. I I think if there is enough pull on the consumer side. Um, probably the next 10 years. Good deal. All right, well, Christy, thank you so very much. This has been a wonderful webinar. Um, we thank everyone for their attendance. And anyone who registered, we will shortly email a link to uh, download a copy of the slides, and then by tomorrow, a copy of the video webcast. Thank you for attending.